This episode is called the Sarissa's Song. So let me explain what a Sarissa is right away. The Sarissa was a weapon that was invented by Alexander the Great's father, Philip of Macedon, and incorporated into his army, and that Alexander the Great used to great effect when, uh, with his army when he conquered the Persian Empire. Now, Sarissa, if you remember when we went back, we were talking about the Spartans and how when they used to fight, they used an eight-foot spear that they would thrust overhand over their shields with. Well, the Sarissa was three times longer than that. It was so long that, uh, and it was wielded in the phalanx. The phalanx would carry it in two hand. It became a two-handed pike, and they would march toward the enemy held, holding the Sarissa like this, and then as they approached the enemy, they would lower it like this. And the way the phalanx worked, this is really kind of almost amazing to even think about, was they advanced in files 16 men deep. And the front could be as long as a quarter mile across or even longer. And so 16 men deep carrying this sarissa. And as they approached the enemy, the sarissas were like so long with a big iron warhead that they would actually wave like that. And they were so long and extended so far ahead of the front that the, the, the sarissas of the first five ranks extended ahead of the, of the advancing front. So if you were the enemy, you had to be absolutely crazy to charge into that. In fact, you didn't charge into it. You just ran away from it. So this is about the sarissa song. And it was, I was thinking as I was writing The Virtues of War about Alexander that when they would stack arms and they would stack the sarissas, you know, 16 together, what happens with that, when the wind blows over shafts like that, it creates a kind of a piping sound and it's always a mournful sound. And so that became, in my imagination, the sarissas song. And the sarissas song had words to it. And it's just a four short lines and it went like this. The sarissas song is a sad song he pipes it soft and low. I would ply a gentler trade, says he, but war is all I know. Now, what that's about in terms of our archetype thinking is being stuck in the warrior archetype. I would ply a gentler trade, says he, but war is all I know. And I think that there are many of us today, particularly in America, who are kind of stuck in the warrior archetype and seeking a way to get beyond that. Now, let me go to a scene. I want to read a scene to you or tell you a little historical stuff. We talked in a couple of episodes ago about when Alexander's army reached India and they encountered for the first time yogis, naked wise men, they called them. And they was, these were the sages, the mendicants, the um, renunciants who would sit in contemplation all day in the sun by the rivers and the interesting thing was that Alexander's soldiers and officers had a great affinity immediately for these yogis. They just liked them right off the bat. And the yogis liked them. And they had a kind of a back and forth. And if you remember a couple of episodes ago, we were talking about my character, Telamon, the solitary mercenary, and how he really respected these yogis. And he saw them as soldiers because he saw them using the soldierly virtues. He said they sit all day at their post, never relinquishing it for, for heat, for fatigue, for cold, for thirst, for anything. They remained focused on the inner war. And so Telamon was quite taken with these guys and really admired them. And again, we're thinking about what lies beyond the warrior archetype. Now I'm gonna read a little something from the end of The Virtues of War on this subject. This is a scene, it's the last scene in The Virtues of War, and it's narrated by Alexander's nephew. And he talks, uh, he talks about this, the last day in India. I close this document with an anecdote of India. On the river Hyphasis, when the army refused to go on, Alexander erected 12 great altars to mark for the ages the farthest limit of his conquests. I attended among numerous officers at the dedication of these monuments. The day was bright and windy, as it often is in that country in the intervals between torrential downpours. As the party turned back toward camp, Telamon, my favorite character, the Arcadian mercenary, 
presented himself before the king, before Alexander. Apparently, he and Alexander had an understanding of many years that of all the army, Telamon alone might claim his discharge from service at any time, any place. This he now did. Alexander reacted at first with surprise and regret at the prospect of being deprived of his friend's much-loved company. Yet he at once recovered, offering to load the man down with treasure. What did Telamon wish? Money, women, an escort at arms? With a smile, the Arcadian declared that he bore on his person all that he required. This, one could see, was nothing but a staff, some utensils, and a modest pack. Alexander, struck by this, asked the mercenary where he intended to go. Telamon indicated the high road east, upon which a number of Indian pilgrims, these are the yogis, the so-called naked wise men, then trekked. These fellows interest me. He wished, he said, Telamon said, to make himself their student. To learn what, Alexander inquired. What comes after being a soldier, said Telamon. Alexander smiled. He extended his right hand. Telamon clasped it. Come with me, he said. I stood directly to Alexander's left, as close to him as a man is to his own arm. It seemed to me that for a moment the king truly considered this. Then he smiled. Of course he could not go. Already aides and chancellors were calling him apart to other business. The grooms brought the party's horses. Something made me remain at Telamon's side. As Alexander prepared to mount, a sad, sweet piping sound caught his ear. He turned toward the sound. There, where the royal lancers had made their temporary camp, a brace of cavalry sarissas, like we were just talking about, stood upright at the ready. The wind passing across their serried shafts produced the melancholy chord. The sarissas are singing, Telamon, said Alexander. Tell me, will you miss their song? The king and the mercenary exchanged a valedictory glance. Then one of Alexander's pages boosted him onto his horse's back. I half recalled the tale of the Sarissa's song, but could not bring back the full story. What was it, I asked Telamon. The Arcadian was about to answer when Alexander, overhearing, turned back in the saddle and responded himself. The Sarissa's song is a sad song. He pipes it soft and low. I would ply a gentler trade, says he, but war is all I know. The wind rose in that moment, lifting the corner of Alexander's cloak. I saw his heel tap his mount's flank. He reined about and started for the camp, surrounded by his officers. That's the last sentence of The Virtues of War about Alexander the Great. And what's interesting to me about that as a writer is that the character of Telamon, who is now moving beyond the warrior archetype, he's moving toward the sage archetype, following these naked wise men often in their, in their pilgrimage. What's interesting to me is that this character, who's a minor character in two books, turned out to be the closing image of two books out of three for me, and I didn't plan this at all. So it tells me that there's something going on there with this character, at least as far as I'm concerned. And that's why I do have a new book that's coming with follows Telemann's journey a little farther along the road. But the point here for this, for this episode, the Sarissa song, is the question, what lies beyond the warrior archetype? And what sort of a warrior is ready to move on to the next stage, whatever that may be? Mm -hmm.